So good morning, everybody. Uh, okay, it's nice to have you here. Uh, I see a number of uh, friends uh, of the old time. Uh, we are here to, and, and there are uh, uh, many other connected uh, uh, remotely. Uh, so I welcome everybody, both in here and uh, on the internet. So we are here, we have thought to have this, uh, say, half a day of uh, discussion together to honor the memory of two people who have, uh, I think, uh, really contributed a lot to the life, scientific life of this laboratory in the, the course of the last uh, 20 years. And uh, also, I think uh, you all agree that I've contributed a lot of uh, our personal life, uh, our uh, not only uh, not only our scientific uh, career, but also our uh, let's say human uh, life as human beings. Um, Paul and Juliet are for sure. Uh, uh, a, a, a couple of names that cannot be split uh, whenever we talk about Paolo, we talk about Juliet and vice versa. And so uh, we are using this sad moment of uh, this uh, recent uh, uh, day in which Paolo passed away to, to make the point and to, to, to remember them. I think uh, we, we have thought that the best way to remember them is, uh, is, is, to, uh, is to make the point together, all, all of us who have been there, uh, in, in many cases, uh, their pupils, uh, and sometimes their friends and collaborators only, uh, to make the point of what we are doing now, what is, uh, what is uh, uh, the... What, what, what has come out from uh, the old time of Chloe in the present uh, uh, science, what we are doing. And uh, then uh, we will devote also the last part of our, of our meeting in the afternoon uh, to, uh, okay, just uh, memories of the old times with, uh, together with Paula and Juliet. Uh, we will have also the occasion to make a, a short walk uh, to and a visit to our beloved uh, detector, Chloe. Uh, it, it will be one of the last occasion in which, in which we will see it in, here, because as uh, we will see during the, 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 the meeting, uh, it's, it's thought to, to go far from here to the United States for a new adventure. So um, thank you again, uh, everybody. We, we can start uh, with, uh, with Gino that we will talk about uh, uh, the, 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 new, the news about flavor physics. Okay. This is okay. Okay, it's a, despite the, it's a, yeah, it, it, it's a sad occasion. On the other hand, it's a, it's nice to be back here. And, um, and I think, and it's also very nice to think back to the, to the old days with the discussing Paolo about uh, flavor physics. I mean, I, I will always remember, I mean, the, the many, many discussion we had. So indeed, when, when we we're discussing with, with Fabio, what, what to, to, to how to celebrate, I mean, how to, to, to remember them. It, as Fabio said, I'll tell you, I mean, some, some old and, and more recent news about uh, beef, about flavor physics, which I think is still a very interesting uh, subject. Actually, <laughs> interestingly enough, the most interesting things are really related still to same electronic decays, which has been one of the key areas where, where Paolo left a very important contribution. So this is my, the plan of my talk. Uh, so really, I want to give you an update of I mean, starting from the old problems in, in flavor physics and then some more recent developments. 
Well, okay, so as you know, we, we have a fantastic theory in particle physics that we call the, the standard model, which is remarkably simple okay, in terms of, of basic concepts. So we have the, the, the matter fields and the, and the mediators. And, uh, and if you want, it's really, we can define this theory as the theory of the long range forces acting on this matter field with a non-trivial aspect, which is the Higgs boson, which determines the, the ground state. However, as we all know, we discussed it many times, but I think it's still worth it to repeat it. We think this is not the, the end of the story. You know, there are a lot of problems, different category of problems, some, some, some theoretical problems like the electroweak hierarchy or the fiber puzzle, which indeed is, is still very important. And also some more observational problems like dark matter and dark energy and so on, that let us think that the standard model should be regarded as an effective field theory. Actually, recently, I mean, in the last 20 years, we understood that all quantum field theory are naturally effective theories. There's not a fundamental quantum field theory. All theories are just effective theories. They are valid in a certain energy range. So indeed, what we think is that this corner here is a, is a corner of something bigger that we call UV theory that we still don't know what it is. And the, if you have to summarize in two sentences what the LSC told us in the, 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 the first two run is that okay, clearly we have found the Higgs boson very early. This is light, so it completes this part of the spectrum here. And the most important message that there is a mass gap. So clearly there is nothing just around the corner which of course is a unfortunate in a sense, because otherwise it would be more fun. But also it's interesting that let, let's think about uh, deeper what, what is this completion. And also it really justify this considering standard model as an effective theory, because whenever there is an, an, a mass gap, the, the tool of effective theories becomes important. And what we will do now in the next uh, 30 years or so is basically still to, to sorry, to, to study this effective theory. Again, to make an, a, a, an example of what I'm um, just uh, to, to, to illustrate to the non-expert what we would like to understand, of course, is that we identify the, the long range structure of a, of a theory, really what means the, the more macroscopic structure we want to understand which are the, the deeper constituents. Which is, of course, if you, if you can break your, your thesis, it's easy, but we, we cannot do it. We cannot do it because, uh, so ideally, we would like to go to, to high energies, but for the next 30 years, we will not, this will not be possible. So for the time being, what we can do to extract the information about this uh, UV completion, UV stands for ultraviolet, okay, is just investigating better this effective theory. And we, we can investigate at different level, actually trying to probe the, the boundary really at the most higher energy that we have, but also trying to understand deeper all the mixing structure that we observe at energy, which is very complicated. Uh, so it's conceptually simple, but it's, strange as we will discuss more. So there are a lot of couplings in this part of the Lagrangian which are tuned, are strange, they have very peculiar values. And this gives rise to a series of accidental symmetries that still, still are a bit uh, unclear why, if they are completely accidental or maybe they hint to something deeper. So we really have to learn a lot in the next 30 years taking this theory as an effective theory to understand what's, what's beyond. We cannot really directly go and, and break the, the, the pieces. So again, coming back to, to my example of the construction game. Okay, if you cannot break the pieces, the best you can do, if you just look at the long range structure is to understand if there are things which are still macroscopic or means still long range, but you cannot describe in terms of the pieces that, that you have, okay? And flavor physics is really essential for this purpose. It's really, the most rich source of information about the standard model as effective theories, because it's the one that gives us more hints on something strange and also the, the, the one that is more observable to, to, to play with. Okay, so let me spend a few words about the, the flavor structure of the standard model. Okay, so, I mean, the, the mystery of why we have three generation of quark and leptons, so why we have this structure of three three families, which seems to be identical except for the mass, is one of the most old fascinating, fascinating and somehow still open problems in particle physics. You know, these, these are a rep graphical representation of the masses. And let me stress that Paolo really contributed a lot to this field from the very beginning. So sometimes we, we tend to forget, but 
uh, indeed, I, I remember because also he was a, you know, a very good friend of, of Nicola Gabibbo. And really in the old days, this was a paper in, in 1962, where, I mean, basically they show how to test the conservation of the vector, vector, vector current in some um, hyperon decays. And the conservation of the vector current was really a key ingredient and then let Kabibo to, to formulate his theory about the, the, the mixing in the, here, just in the sector of, of the left family. And, and really, also this tells us a lot about Paul. I mean, that really also, he was not a fantastic experimentalist, but also knew a lot about theory. I think I remember a talk by, by Nicola. He always said that it was Paul who really encouraged him to do something, okay, deeper in, in this field. I mean, uh, yeah, it, it was a sentence, Paolo, do something uh, more fundamental after what we started to understood uh, experimentally. So I think this was really probably one of his first contributions to, to this field. Okay, so coming back to, to the standard model. Okay, we have the standard model Lagrangian has two parts, the gauge and the Higgs sector. And, and in this gauge sector, indeed, which is the gauge, then, the forces, we observe a flavor degeneracy. So here, if, if, I, if I move uh, uh, along this uh, column here, nothing changed from the point of view of the forces, okay? And this is, is this something fundamental or accidental? This is the big question, okay? That we never, we still don't understand. And of course, uh, we know that what distinguish them is when we switch off, switch on, sorry, the, the Higgs field, the Higgs field is the, is the one that distinguishes the, the families with these couplings, which are the, the Yukawa coupling, which connect the different quarks and different leptons with different flavor indices. And this way we describe the mass. So this way we describe this hierarchical structure of, of different masses that we observe in nature. And this is the only interaction that's not a model that distinguishes flavor. And not only is peculiar because of the masses that are very hierarchical, but as you know, when we look at these two, you have a couple here, why up and why down, here we have the same type of left-handed field, which means that we can, from the point of view of the gauge interaction, we can really measure the misalignment of these two uh, uh, direction in flavor space, which I like to, to think as two really, yeah, the, the, the Yukawa coupling are non-trivial direction flavor space. So if we switch off the Yukawa coupling, there is a big symmetry. These Yukawa coupling are non-trivial direction. And in the case of the quark, we can measure the misalignment, which is the, the Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa matrix, is the misalignment of the two Yukawa coupling. And as you know, this, this matrix is again, very peculiar. So here again is a graphical representation. We have the diagonal entries, which are one, and very small entries, which are tiny. Again, here is the, the, the Kabibo angle. And then we have, for instance, the, the tiniest entry, which is VUB, which has been measured uh, in, in, in V2U the case. And again, here, Paolo contribution has been very important. So again, I, I want to highlight that. Again, you, you know very well the, the story of US. So actually, he really contributed a lot to these two elements. Concerning VUS, okay, here, I don't, make, don't need to, to, to discuss this at length, but I think it was really, I remember because I, I was here, there was really a revolution in the, in the precision of the US when, uh, when, when Chloe entered in. And I think Paolo really understood that that was the, the, the best things, one of the most important contribution to, to be given by Chloe. And then there was a kind of shift in the interest of the experiment, which I think was very beneficial. And actually it was a very success story uh, reaching this, this uh, level of precision, which actually indeed, then also other experiments uh, enter into the game. Some of them were, were in, but what was really fascinating was to see how the field became really a systematic uh, field, which was not the case before. No, previously, we were just measuring the branch duration. Then finally, it was understood that one has to measure all the, the slope systematically then to disentangle the, the, the correlation. That was really a very fascinating study that finally led to this high level of, of precision. But uh, it, it, the other story that I think we should not forget, uh, which, because I remember discussing with, with Paolo, many times was actually his contribution to VUB. So he was in, in the CASP experiment, which put a very, very stringent bound on this uh, B going to uh, U decay. And that, that, at that time, that was a, a really a surprise. So they put this limit on VUB over VCB, not observing, you see, this is, this is the spectrum of cell tonic B decay. This is the, the charm which has a, a endpoint here. This would have been the B2U, which has, a, of course, a much uh, a richer spectrum, a much uh, richer phase space. 
and they could not see that and they put this very stringent limit which at that time he, he thought, i remember he told me the story that all the, the, the theoretician told him that was wrong because they thought okay nobody thought that the ckm was so hierarchical so they would expect something of the same order of vcb and then it was, was a big surprise also this way you could not explain big bar mixing because there was the prejudice that the top mass had to be 50 gv so and, and, but they really stand on the point we don't see it and finally indeed they were right of course so vb is, is really small okay so this is again this peculiarity of, of flavor physics uh, which which is there since a long time so even forgetting now the, the recent anomalies on which i will spend some time now in, in in the rest of the talk but still there are these open issues which are with us since a long time so is this pattern of the Yukawa coupling accidental or there is a deeper explanation for that and this is sometimes called the, the standard model favor puzzle and we should really put the two things together the ckm on the one hand and the masses on the other hand because the the, the real ingredient is the yukawa coupling okay so for instance here i plot again this uh, graphic representation of the up quark yukawa coupling you see there is a big the only one big entry which is the top mass which is one and then there are these other entries uh, which are so this is the, the yukawa coupling in the basis where y down is diagonal so you have these other entries which are populated by the ckm and also take into account the small masses of the quarks and you see it is a very strong hierarchical structure which call for a deeper explanation okay so this is i, I don't believe this is accidental so this is one, one big question but then the other question is if the standard model is only an effective theory valid below a, a, a certain cutoff why we don't see many deviation this is the other big question I mean, why we there are a lot of processes which are suppressing the standard model and we don't see a uh, deviation so and that we want the big question is which is the flavor structure of physics beyond the sun model so do we have again some symmetries and small symmetry breaking terms it's, it's it's not clear but these are the two big big question and, and the nice things is that i think this why i'm excited about this field is that these recent results especially by lacb seem to provide some answer to this uh, deep question and to to discuss this i mean the last let me introduce the last technical thing which is uh, indeed how we describe flavor physics beyond the standard model and so we which i call it the flavor structure of the smef that is the, now the, the name that we give to the standard model seen as an effective theory so as i told you the, the modern point of view on the standard model grandeur is that it's just the low energy limit of something deeper with more degrees of freedom but if we cannot excite the high energies of freedom, the, the way to describe physics is via an effective Lagrangian of this type. So we have this part, which is what we used to call the standard model, which again are just the interactions surviving at large distances. So the link, long range forces of the standard model particle plus the ground state. All the rest uh, you can describe by contact interaction. Okay. It's a, it's a general theory in quantum field theory. So all the rest, uh, if there is some heavy dynamics, uh, laptop quarks z prime supersymmetry you are not able to excite it so you will describe it as for fermion interaction generalized fermi theory and you just can, can classify this operator and that that and you can probe it in experiment to see if there is anything there now <clears throat> the way to try to isolate these pieces is first to understand exactly what the standard model predicts and the standard model in flavor it has these two ingredients so there is a large flavor symmetry here from the gate sector and a very peculiar breaking by this Yukawa interaction. This is the, the key point. So we have the interplay between the flavor symmetry and the peculiar breaking structure because we can break flavor at a large distance only in certain direction, just because we cannot write other operator. This implies a series of exact and approximate symmetries that the more I think about, the more I think these are just accidental symmetries. Just to make two example, I mean the individual lepton flavor. Okay, actually this should be tau. Okay, the, the individual lepton flavor is just an exact symmetry in the standard model, but is accidental simply because you cannot write anything that violated it using this field here and stopping at large distance. That is dimension four operator. You cannot write it. So accidentally you get this symmetry for free. Another example, which maybe it's, it's less obvious, but also very interesting, is isospin. So isospin is the, an approximate, again, accidental symmetry, simply because the masses of up and down are very small. Actually, they're very different. You know, 
but they are small, so you can neglect them. And in the limit, when you neglect, you get isospin. But you see, again, it's, it's accidental simply because these are small, and again, it's related to this peculiar breaking. So let me spend one more minute on this concept of accidental symmetry, which is very important. So and it, the, the great interest in, in precision measurement is the possibility to, to test these, these extra operators here, even if they are suppressed by, by heavy scale, or if they are suppressed by small cupping, okay? And the fact that, that you can violate the symmetry here is, is very powerful. So I, I, this really is, is the, the goal of, uh, of doing flavor physics with, with high precision. So again, accidental symmetries are symmetries which are not fundamental properties of the underlying theory. So if you have a theory which uh, doesn't have symmetry, automatically at low energies, you get enhanced symmetry. This is like, uh, I mean, my, my friend, uh, Ricardo Artazio, always emphasizes, it's like the multiple expansion. I mean, if you look at the, at the, at the charge uh, distribution at a large distance, you only see the total charge. You cannot see dipoles, okay? Because you are at large distance. So even if there is no symmetry, it looks like a spherical symmetry because you only see the points like charge. The more you go deeper, then you understand the structure. The, so you always have an enhanced symmetry at large distance. Because at, at large distance, or if you want at, uh, normalizable level, you don't have enough variables to describe the violation of the symmetry. But now, if the symmetry is, is violated in the UV, then it will manifest in the contact interaction, which is a suppressed effect. And therefore, searching for violation of the asymptotic symmetry is really the, the tool to see if, which is the structure of the UV theory, especially to see, I mean, the, the symmetry structure, which is much easier than just understanding what's, what's beyond. And we have very known example in the past, actually, the, the, even the, the, the Fermi theory is an example of this type. So the Fermi theory was discovered because was violating flavor in the, in the old sense. I mean, U to D transition. U to D transition, you cannot do it with strong interaction. You cannot do it with electromagnetic. You can do it with the Fermi and did how the, the weak interaction was discovered. Weak interaction also predict the neutral current, but neutral current, you cannot see it because they share the same symmetries of the strong and the electromagnetic. So looking for violation is give you a much higher sensitivity to new physics. And so I, I stress all this because these anomalies reported in recent data belong exactly to, to this category. So a violation of an accidental symmetry. So let me go to the, to the anomalies, which I find uh, interesting. So since 2013, again, in semi-electronic BDKs, uh, there's been hint reported by mainly LCB, but actually even partially uh, Babar and, and, and Bell of lepton flavor universality violation. That is, we seem to see a different behavior beside pure kinematical effect of the different lepton species in this type of transition. You see this transition, for instance, in the case of B2S LL, we compare mu versus electron. These are complicated process, very complicated with a lot of uh, gauge boson here. But at the end, when you couple to mu and electron, you couple with a Z or a photon, and this is universal, no matter what. Okay, from the point of view of the interaction. So, you see this, what is this LFU? LFU is a, an accidental symmetry of the standard model Lagrangian in the limit where we neglect the left on Yukawa coupling. And this is the usual working point that we, because we always neglect the Yukawa coupling in the interaction. Of course, we keep it to describe the ground state, to describe the masses, we have to keep it. But then we forget it, for instance, when, when I compute here this decay, I don't put the Higgs because this has a, such a tiny coupling that I ne neglect it. Okay, so this is why accidentally, I seem to see a universality. But there is nothing fundamental. I mean, the, the only interaction that can violate the universality, which is the Higgs, violated. However, the strength of the Higgs is, is very small. So actually, since all lepton masses are very small, Within the standard model, we expect all lepsons to behave in the same manner, except for pure kinematical effect. But again, this could be just an accidental fact related that the Higgs coupling are, are small. And it could be just an accidental fact of the long range forces of the standard model. And so just a flash on, on the data. You see, in B2SLL, we have a lot of results, quite high significance when we put them all together of these, uh, uh, the, the most, the cleanest things come from these ratios, okay, ratios of muons versus electron in a given type of, of transition. And um, okay, not, mm, no, no, none of, the, of those is striking, okay, except this one, which has a high significance, but when you put them all together, you get a high significance. And, and what is nice is that this, 
goes together with other uh, observation like the smallness of the SP mu, which again alone is only two sigma, but still actually goes exactly in the same level of, of this type of, of effect. And finally, there are also these anomalies in the angular distribution or the branching ratio of process with mu only, which again are much more difficult to, to describe theoretical, but still to the best of our knowledge, all these fits together, pointing to a new contact interaction. This is the key point. It seems to be well described by a new contact interaction, very small. Actually, to, 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 to put the things in context, actually the, the significance, the significance is, is quite high. I mean, you see, to describe this effect, we describe with this type of, of contact interaction, if you just take the best new physics option, which is so it's a, it's a specific uh, new physics hypothesis, you get from a fit of standard model versus best new physics, you get the five sigma significant. I don't claim that we have yet at the five sigma level because uh, this is just the best uh, I've talked and I've chosen the best new physics option. Still, it tells you that the significance is high. Actually, this is high even if I if I don't put all the observable sensi to, to, to hadronic effect, otherwise it would go even more than five sigma. On the other hand, if you try to be conservative, if you look at the global significance, so if you try all the possible new physics uh, uh, chance, you get something which is four sigma, which is okay. I think it's still remarkable. The other sector is, uh, is those of V2Charm uh, uh, tau decays. Okay, here it seems that there is a evidence for this type of interaction between two charm tau neutrino that we detect again in this ratio where we see possible violation of universality. Here you see this is the, the experimental situation where, okay, if you average all the results which are well compatible, you get to this ellipse at the one sigma, which is the, so, but at three sigma, you are touching the standard model prediction. So the standard model is essentially at the three sigma level. Again, here there is more debate also on, on the theory error, but everybody agreed that there is some anomaly. So summarizing, if you put these things uh, in, together, and I like to put them together because they seem to have a nice structure, which is the following. So we seem to have a, a large coupling B2C tau neutrinos where we have mainly third generation field. So you see B tau neutrino, and we have a small coupling, but with a higher significance in B2S mu mu where we have more second generation field. So I like to put these two things together and we are doing this since already since uh, several years because really, point to the same pattern of the standard model Yukawa coupling. So something bigger when we have more third generation and smaller when we have second generation. So the idea is that we have something large for the third generation and smaller, smaller when we go to lighter generation. So it seems to possibly open a connection to this flavor puzzle. And so what I want to discuss now finally here is a possible new paradigm, which I think really is a bit different way of thinking about the ultraviolet completion of the standard model with respect to what we were thinking 20 years ago. See, what we were thinking 20 years ago, the old paradigm, which was basically inspired by supersymmetry. And so it was the following idea that, okay, here we have our effective theory, the standard model. And then there is the mass gap, but then we have something that stabilizes the Higgs sector because we all think that there must be some new physics stabilizing the Higgs sector. It's the only unstable scale in the theory. But then we were thinking that there was some flavor blind dynamics not to disturb flavor. Essentially, this was the motivation because we were not seeing anything kick about mixing and so on. And then the origin of the Yukawa company was postponed to, let's say, gut scale. So the, the idea of this approach was, okay, let's concentrate on the stabilization of the Higgs sector via some flavor blind dynamics and let's postpone, or if you want, ignore the flavor problem, put it a much higher scale, which of course is, is possible but it's not the only option. And so this was in a sense, the way of putting uh, in stone, the fact that we have these identical copies, that the three families are identical up to high energy scale, which is not uh, given by the doctor, okay? So, and it's not even given by any strong argument. It was just an, an empirical observation. I think if these anomalies are correct, eh, we can think of something different, which is this other picture here which again was something that was conceived well before the anomalies and now clearly has, has found the revival, but it's a multi-scale picture. That is, okay, we have here the standard model, we know that there is this mass gap. Here we, we have the dynamics stabilizing the Higgs, but also here is where you generate some of the Yukawa coupling, the Yukawa coupling of the third generation. And then we have to go higher to generate 
So the Yukawa coupling for the second generation is even higher to generate the Yukawa coupling of the first generation. So the idea is that the <coughs> new physics speak with the light generation at higher scale. And this is why we have not seen anything in K, in K, K bar mixing and so on, because we were playing only with these light families, which speak with new physics at higher scale. On the other hand, the third family that speak with new physics at lower scale. And this is, in a sense, explained both why the Yukawa coupling is big for the generation and also why these anomalies appear first in the third generation. So I think it's a, it's a very suggestive picture, which if you want later we can discuss in more really technically works. And, and the idea is that what, now what, what we are exploring now here is this window here. This is some TV scale. So where, okay, we have our electroweak scale and then we have at this few TV, new physics coupled mainly to the third generation with of course some small misalignment that connected to the first generation. This misalignment is exactly the same things that we have in the Yukawa coupling. These small entries related to VCB and, and BUB, which as Paolo told us already a long time ago, are, are small. Okay, so I think this is a very, very nice picture. And again, let me put it again in, in another context, again, in terms of, of effective theory. So the only thing which is, I mean, the, the one for which we have the highest significance is this type of interaction, B2S, U mu. I, I, I put with the, with the dash, second generation field, okay? This interaction is small. Actually, if I put an effective scale of, of one TV, here the coupling is 10 to minus three, so it's a very tiny effect. But it's the one that shows up nicely because it violated the accidental symmetry in, uh, in B2SLM. So violation of the accidental symmetry seen despite occurring at apparently high energy scale. Of course, if you interpret all these as a, an effective scale, this is a very heavy scale. But actually you see here, I already anticipate that this is is the low scale, but with a small coupling. And the idea is that there is a natural flavor connection to a much stronger interaction occurring at much lower energies, so a few TV, but involving only third generation, so BB tau tau. And of course, there, are, there should be all the intermediate step, like also B2S tau tau or B2S tau mu, with different scaling, and the scaling is 10 to minus one each time you put the second generation field. Yes. And this actually fits well with, with all the data. And this way you really fit, uh, describe well all, all we, what, what we observe in, in B2 to charm uh, consistently. Okay, again, I don't have too much time, but the most important is that you predict also this effect is here, you predict something that should be seen in PP to tau tau at high energies. And it opened up the possibility to stabilize the Higgs sector because we have new physics around the corner. Actually, still few, very recently I was saying this is uh, still uh, not seen and, and still a hope. Now, Okay, we have not yet seen that, but it's nice that the, the recent bound on tau tau uh, distribution, Dreleyan from high PT actually are weaker than expected the bound. So you can call it a one sigma evidence, which okay, of course it's not an evidence, but it's, it's nice that it's not ruled out. And it, it's telling us that now in the, in the next run, you will be able really to probe the interesting region here. And also there are interesting theoretical work that really tells you that we can really stabilize the Higgs sector in a model with the, with the laptop work, which okay, I, I don't have time to discuss. So I think it's a, it's a promising tail connecting all of these anomalies. So if confirmed and combined, these two set of anomalies point to non-trivial dynamics around the TV scale, not really at one TV, a bit above, but not too much, involving many other family that might be connected to the origin of flavor here. So really this, this multi-scale picture seems to, to work. And, and one can test that this is the most important thing as we are here in, in the lab, we have predictions. So prediction is that, okay, for instance, this P2 tau tau, there is a, a preferred window that could be covered with the high PT experiment. And of course, also low energy experiments are, are very important. That one should see at some point some violation of uh, <clears throat> lepton flavor in, in BDKs that even affect in, in count the case, which I don't have time to, to discuss. But okay, so last few minutes, let me come back to, to Paolo and Juliet. I think, uh, for me, it's really be a, a, a pleasure and an honor, I guess, for, as for many of you to, to discuss physics and beyond with, with Paolo and Juliet over, over the many years that I spent in Frascati. And we, with Paolo, we really discussed a lot about, about flavor physics. And I think he, I think he underestimated his importance in, in flavor physics, really with the, this important contribution to the determination of US and, BC, and, B, and, and UB, a, a really cornerstone of our field. And, and I, I learned a lot from him in particular, how difficult it is to do precision physics actually 
I see it as an experiment, as a theoretician, I mean, uh, you know, much better than me, but again, it's a, uh, and also for me, it was very important also discussing with him to understand the, uh, we even had some more recently in the last uh, years, when he, he was a bit sick, but we had some email exchange about uh, the, the LSD result, but of course he didn't did it at all. But, <laughs> but uh, okay, still also his, his passion for, for understanding the, the, the level of precision, I think uh, this experiment was very important. I remember also, the interplay of theory and experiment, the, the, the work we did on the, on the, on the Monte Carlo for, 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 for Florida, that, that, that you did, but again, you know, I, I was involved with really very important. And, and I think it was still from these old generations that really theory and experiment goes together, which I think it's a, it was fantastic. And, uh, and also, again, as I stress, his intuition that we really should focus on, on semitonic the case for Floyd was uh, really beneficial. And he was really deeply convinced that indeed these Investigating better this contact interaction is a, is a way to go to test as a model deeply, which I think is still a mess of value today. Now, for, for B physics, uh, but maybe even for, for Kim physics, now there are some, some anomalies which are interesting. And I think it's, it's a very promising field. But finally, what I admire more in Paul and Juliet, uh, uh, now also because I, I, I interact more with, with the young people, I mean, it's really their passion for physics and the their dedication in training a, a, a generation of, of new, uh, of, of young scientists, which I've seen here growing a bit far, but I think close enough. And I think that their legacy from this point of view, it's, uh, it's very visible in this lab and also beyond. I, I had this picture, which I prepared for his 70th birthday. I hope many, many of you are, are here, probably the others are not even in this picture, but again, all this, this, this young generation, which now are, are the new generation in this lab and, and beyond, I think is really their legacy, okay? So this, nice things which I found on the web, which I think uh, we remain uh, forever. So I wish to tell them goodbye because I think, uh, and of course, as you said, we will always remember them together. Okay, thank you. I think we will have time for one or two uh, questions, uh, if any. I don't know whether in people from uh, from outside are wanting to make questions. If not, there is one here. It's, it's, okay, Pierluigi. Aspetta, c'è un microfono. Eugenio for this very inspiring talk. And, uh, I have two questions. First, uh, in the, the multi-scale uh, configuration of the minimum level violation, is there any space for other anomalies like G minus two, for example? This was the first question. And the second is uh, if in this in, in this in particular. If in this new scheme uh, you have uh, a, a, let's say, encouraging prediction for mu to e, uh, case some, something changes there. <clears throat> yes, so uh, thanks for the question. Uh, okay, G minus two is an interesting story. So I think G minus two doesn't fit naively in this picture, at least in the minimal version, because it's too big the anomaly there. But there are variations on the team. Still, I think uh, they did, I think, unfortunately, here I don't have a slide on G minus two, but um, uh, I think there are, uh, yeah, I don't have it, sorry. Uh, there, are, there are ideas to, 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 to fit in G minus two, but I think uh, to fit in G minus two, you need to do something strange on flavor. And sometimes you really need to treat differently quark and lepton. This is the why I still don't like it too much. Again, my, my personal point. Because what is nice here is that you really automatically also predict the, as an effect of this multi-scale structure, the mixing in the quark. And you predict some mixing also in the leptons. But the mixing of the lepton doesn't go well with G minus two, because if you have mixing, then you would have already seen mu to e gamma that you have not seen. So if G minus two is conserved, is, uh, is confirmed, maybe one should go to a different uh, direction, which many people are exploring, would be something special for the, for the leptons that is a new, really 
a deeper flavor symmetry like uh, L mu minus L tau really as a gauge symmetry, which is something different. So in, in this picture really doesn't fit in a, at least in a simple way. On the other hand, for instance, you know, there was a, the W mass anomaly, I still don't understood, so I don't know how to average the different results. On the other hand, that fit easily because I mean, this dynamics that we have here is really affect electroweak observable. And again, we were stupid enough not to compute what you do for, now we compute a posteriori and really for the most natural set of many you predict an enhancement of the W mass easily, okay? Of course, I can, it's an a posteriori thing, but this fits well. Now, how big this is, maybe it's in between the CDF and the other, but you automatically predict something there. So this is nice. As, I mean, as an effect of the fact that you really predict some new dynamics not far involving the, the third generation. And this clearly did modify a bit the, the, the top sector, which you know is indeed the one that gives the correction to the, to the W mass. So that would fit nicely. And sorry, and yet you said about new to E. No, <clears throat> new to E. Again, here the message is that uh, these uh, contact interactions are important. So here, of course, at some point, I will have something like SS mu E if I go up, which means smaller, but has to be there. And uh, again, I think the natural expectation here, there are things that you don't know yet because we don't know exactly the mixing in the, in the left-hand sector, especially the one-two mixing. It's not that like in the court where we really know it, but the natural expectation is that for instance, these <clears throat> mu to three or mu to E conversion in nuclei is very interesting. In a sense, even more interesting than mutual gamma, because it really is via the contact interaction, which are actually, especially even the, the um, I mean, both mutual three and mutual gamma, sorry, sorry, mutual three and mutual conversion, the next generation would be very interesting to, could, could see something. It cannot, it's not guaranteed, but it's, it's very interesting for, for this type of model. Shall you answer it? But on the top sector, the only, the only observable, the only effect you will have is this uh, effect on the W mass for the other. For no, the no, there are, there are a lot of very interesting observable on, on the high production of top. So you expect also, like you expect some, um, some deviation in PP to tau tau, you expect some deviation in PP to top top, even PP to four top could be interesting, okay? It's more model dependent, but the, the message is that for the high PT experiment, it's third generation. So everything involving third generation field in the final state can be easily modified, actually is naturally modified. So there is a prediction, actually one of the strongest bound on the model is the fact that for the moment we don't have any excess in PP to top top. So PP to the excess in top top should be one of the next thing one should see. So it's interesting in, not in top decay, but in top as final state is the interesting thing. Because of the BB. Plus and minus P to bar, I mean, you might have some deviation. Sorry? Plus and minus P to bar. If plus and minus two TT bar. TT bar. So you mean the TT bar production in the plus and minus machine? Oh, we don't have a plus and minus machine, but okay. okay. Ah, for the fusion. No, for the. Uh, yeah, there, uh, there you should see also something. Yeah, you should see something because it will be the TTZ coupling where you have it. This is smaller because it's electroweak, but still is, is uh, possibly visible, yeah. The discussion of the going to be really necessary to go that pressure, so. No, I think that is an interesting observable also, yes, yes. Thank you very much for you. Very, very well. And we now move to Matthew, which will speak about uh, rare k on the case.
Okay. Okay, so um, I'd like to begin with just a, a couple of words about um, the influence that, that, that Paolo and Juliet had on me as a young physicist, and in particular how interactions with Paolo stimulated me to study rare chaos decays. So this is a picture of, uh, of Paolo and Juliet at Columbia from the Emilio Segre archives. Um, here they're in front of Lowe Library. I, I briefly knew Paolo at Columbia. I, in fact, I had him for what I think was the last semester that he taught at Columbia in spring of 1991 as an intermediate laboratory instructor. So this is an intermediate undergraduate laboratory. You do these classic experience and experiments in mm, atomic and nuclear physics. And at some point, I think I muttered something about how the equipment didn't work. And it turns out that Paolo had actually designed or built most of the equipment in that laboratory. And so he pointed out that um, it wasn't the equipment, it was perhaps the experimenter. And I remember that as being one of my first interactions with Paolo, but uh, it, um, it was interesting. Um, so we had this, this, this brief overlap at Columbia, but six years later, when, see, the thing is, is that, that we, that was his last semester there, okay? And so we knew that he was leaving for Daphne and Chloe, and that really put Daphne and Chloe on our, our radar screen. So six years later, when I was finishing up my, my doctorate, looking for, for the possibility to do an INF and postdoc, um, I wrote Paulo and I asked him about the status of, of Daphne and Chloe. And this is the response that I got. And I think that three things uh, transpire from, from this email, which I, I think are really interesting. Um, so the first is that this is really long and detailed uh, uh, email to receive from somebody who you barely knew, really. I mean, from one semester, six years before, right? You know, uh, so I think that already says something about Paulo's attitude towards students. Um, the second thing is, is that I think there's a lot of pride here that transpires in, in terms of the accomplishments of the collaboration in the laboratory in terms of, of, of preparation for Chloe. And I think um, the third thing is, is that I think is interesting is this PS um, is regards a conversation that we'd had in his office six years earlier. Okay. So, and I think that that is also another thing that, that demonstrates both Paula's sharp memory and his penchant for scientific discussion. So I thought this was a kind of an, an interesting test, testimony of, uh, of what it was like to work with Paolo. So fast forward a few more years and um, I came here to and began working on Chloe. And, um, and perhaps because I, I had this link with, uh, with Brookhaven, uh, Juliet sent me back to Brookhaven first for a seminar in 2000 and for this, this talk at, a, at an AGS workshop that was really kind of an advertisement for the Copio experiment in 2004. And um, this is a slide that, that, that I presented at that workshop um, about the perspectives that we had in Chloe on rare decays at the time. And I think it's a nice summary of, of, of those perspectives and what ultimately became of them. Um, so the, um, you know, at Chloe, I think really we did do pretty much everything that was listed. This was in 2004, so it was before uh, many of these things were done, but we, we really did the things that one could reasonably do with a, with, with a few inverse femme to barns. Um, so, um, yeah, K short to the K short to three pi zero at the level of 10 to minus eight, uh, uh, studies of the semi leptonic, uh, um, the, the K short semi leptonic asymmetry, and the few things that weren't covered by. Chloe ultimately got covered by Chloe too. So I think we really sort of closed the chapter on that. But one thing that, you know, I mean, it was already becoming, this was keep in mind a Copio workshop as well. And so there was this question about could, you know, Chloe actually, some future version of Chloe actually do uh, flavor changing neutral current decays. And, and the answer is that was probably not within reach because you would need hundreds or even thousands of, 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 of inverse femtoforms. But the idea stuck with me and I discussed it with Paulo when, you know, in 2005, 2006, when I was beginning to get interested in NA62. And perhaps also to convince me not to do any 62, he said, well, you know, it took 35 years to measure the real part of epsilon prime over epsilon. It's gonna take 35 more to measure one of the K to pi new new bar branching ratios. But I knew instantly that he was right. And, and, and he was right on several levels. And it wasn't just a question of the time scale, but also a question of the fact that one would need a multi-generational investment where each stage of the experiment built on the next stage because you have to learn how to do this type of measurement and that i think is the thing that really ultimately got me interested in doing rare case. so with that 
said as sort of a, a, a prefix, let me get the main part of the talk, which is sort of rare candy case and where, 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 where we are right now. So I think when I say rare candy case, I'm really talking mainly about the flavor changing neutral current decays. The main ones that are looked at are here in this table. Um, they're all flavor changing neutral current uh, processes that are dominated by the Z penguin box diagrams. And, you know, as Gino very um, elegantly said, these can be related to uh, the, um, the CKM matrix and with, with minimal non-parametric uncertainty. And that allows you to sort of over-constrain um, things in your search for uh, new physics. I'm gonna focus for most of my talk on the Kata Pioneer and Bardigais, um, which are, um, well, they're extremely rare in the standard model and their rates are very precisely predicted. And they're very precisely predicted for a variety of reasons, having to do with things like the pattern of the CKM suppression, but also the fact that you don't have any uh, contributions from uh, states of intermediate photons, and then also even the determination of the hadronics, the hadronic physics is relatively clean. So if you look at the status since, say, before September 2019, when, when, when NA62 came out with a, his first measurements of, of K to Pioneer New Bar, this is the situation that you had. You had a stopped count experiment at Brookhaven, which had measured seven events of K plus to Pi plus New New Bar, and this experiment, Koto, which is going on at J Park in Japan to look for K, K long to Pi zero New New Bar, which had put a branching ratio at the level of a couple of orders of magnitude higher than the standard model branching ratio. Now, it's very important to measure both of the branching ratios because if you can do that, um, not only could you possibly break the standard model, but you also could kind of discriminate among different types of new physics scenarios that you might um, be looking at. And this is um, a plot from a paper by Burris, but the idea here is these are predictions for various new physics extensions where you have the branching ratio of K plus versus the branching ratio of K long. And you, know, you can see the bands of correlation that you expect, for example, from a model in for new physics incorporating minimal flavor violation, or if you have a model in which you have uh, couplings of a particular chirality that dominate, uh, that gives you these two blue branches, for example, or some other type of more generalized model that doesn't have these constraints. But the point is, if you measure both of them, you can sort of understand something already about the type of new physics scenario you're looking at. Um, the other thing that I'd like to mention just really briefly is that if you can measure K plus to pi plus new new bar using essentially an isospin relationship, you can put a boundary on uh, where you would expect the K long pi new new bar branching ratio to be sort of an upper limit that's relatively model independent. This is called the Grossman near bound. So let me begin by talking about the experimental search for K long to pi zero new new bar. Okay, so this is very difficult to do uh, because you, you really don't have very much to go on. Um, you just see a pi zero decaying in vacuum, okay, with momentum imbalance. So you can't measure the K log in the initial state. So um, um, you really have to use vetoes a lot. You know that uh, all the other K log decays have extra particles. And so you have to be very good at vetoing them. Um, and the only kinematic constraint that you really have is the fact that uh, you know the two photons make a pi zero. But usually what you do is you use that in order to see if the decay is in your fiducial volume, basically from the separation, for example, in a particular plane on say a calorimeter, okay? And assuming the, 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 the pi zero uh, mass to get the opening angle, you can tell where the, uh, where the K long uh, decayed. The main background is K long to pi zero, pi zero, which, you know, I mean, at Chloe, we consider to be a rare decay um, at, with a branch ratio at the level of, of, of 10 to the minus three. Um, and then you have various other backgrounds, including some abstruse ones that you might not think about, like lambda to pi zero n and a fixed target experiment, since lambdas and, 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 and kaons are produced order one at, at the same rate. Um, this is a picture of the, of the, of the Kodo experiment at J Park. It's currently running. It's a relatively small, very hermetic experiment, six meters in length. It's basically a bottle of, uh, of, of photon vetoes and calorimeters into which a very thin pencil beam um, is injected. And this has a, um, a, the neutral beam has a mean momentum of about two GeV. Now, Kodo started taking data seriously in 2015. And most of their data comes from the 2016 to 2018 uh, period of running that they did. And then they have some, the, in terms of their published results at least, and then they've been running ever since then. They're actually in a long shutdown right now and they'll start you know, running again soon. But this data hasn't been analyzed yet. Okay, so let me talk a little bit, uh, say a few words on the analysis, their main part of data from 2016 to 2018. Um, the analysis is done in the plane of PT of the two photons versus the moment, the Z position of the vertex from that reconstruction that I was talking about before. 
and they define a signal box uh, in the PTZ plane, and then they have the ability to measure backgrounds and, 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 and compare it to prediction in, in the area around the signal box, and they found these three events in the signal box. Now that three events is interesting because the expected number of signal events was initially 0 0.04, and initially the expected number of background events was about 0 0.1, so this would be, you know, sort of, you know, uh, quite a large excess, and that caused a lot of interest, but as these things go, it turns out that uh, they ultimately, they had froze the, the signal analysis here, but found a new source of background in K plus decays from charge exchange, um, where this, the, this can actually be a very nasty source of background. The, the K plus uh, E3 decay, for example, could be, you, you get a pi zero and a low momentum electron, which might even be going backwards in the experiment and it's easy to miss. But the point is, is that, okay, so they understood this and they, um, um, actually, I, I meant to have another slide here. Um, um, they understood this and um, they have installed a new detector specifically to veto these, 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 these K-plus events. Now, what is the outlook uh, for, the, for the longer term future? Well, it turns out that assuming they get the background problem under control, they still need to, to get another factor of 20 in, in statistics. And so they have this, this medium term plan, as I said, they have a long shutdown right now, and then they will be uh, starting data with a slightly upgraded machine. Um, they need to get to about 100 kilowatts of beam power. So when they come back from the long shutdown, they were at 55 before, when they come back from the long shutdown, they may be at 80. And this is sort of like the, the ballistic trajectory for, 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 for Coda right here, showing that if all of this can be achieved, they might get to the sensitivity of the standard model by about 2025 or so. But to do better, they would need a new experiment. And they've actually had a plan since they proposed Kodo in 2006 to do this. And the plan actually involves building all of this new area of their Hadron Hall. This is the existing part here. So this is an ambitious project. And the Kodo, the new Kodo detector is back here. They need a new beam line at 5 GeV that increases their momentum. It gives them more acceptance. It makes the, the background a little bit easier to, to reject. Um, so anyway, they've had a lot of review work going on and they're right now at the point of trying to make the decision whether or not to go ahead with this. Um, if they do this, they would need a new detector. The detector would have to be much, much bigger because when you go to high momentum in order to preserve the acceptance and actually make it larger, they need to be a, a much bigger detector. So the fiducial volume would go from two meters to 15 meters in length. Um, as I mentioned before, the beam momentum gets somewhat larger. Okay, so now let's take a look at K plus to pi, uh, to, to, to pi plus nu nu bar. And here, the real protagonist is the NA62 experiment at CERN. And you can see a picture of uh, the NA62 experiment in the ECN3 cavern um, at CERN right now. So for K plus to pi plus nu nu bar, NA62 looks for this by the decay and flight method, which is a little different from what they did at Brookhaven back in the 1990s. We actually wanna see the decay and flight. And so what you have is you have a K on track coming in that you have to identify a pi on track going out that you have to identify and nothing else in the final state, but you have this um, um, missing mass at the vertex, which you want to make sure is not one of the two body decays, K to uh, mu nu or K to pi pi zero, because these are order one branching ratios and we are looking for order 10 to the minus 10. So um, basically the analysis is done by taking a look in the plane of the momentum of the pion versus the missing mass at the vertex. And you can see the two body decays here. And you can see the signal regions that you define um, in, in, in this plane. And again, there are regions around those that you can use for the control background where you, where you try to um, um, estimate the, the backgrounds a priori before opening the signal box. So this is a, just a, 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 um, a diagram of the experiment, but really important takeaways here are that the experiment involves high rate precision tracking for the beam, okay, um, and for the secondary, but especially for the beam, even at a rate of 750 megahertz inside of this so-called gauge tracker, redundant PID and muon vetoes for all the particles in the final state, hermetic photon vetoes, which some of which were constructed at this laboratory, and a high performance electromagnetic accelerometer from NA48, the liquid krypton. NA62 took its main data in 2016, 2017, and 2018. By far and away, the 2018 data set was the largest. It always works that way. Um, and, um, and, and the results were um, actually sort of, a re have been recently um, published just last year from, from the analysis of this data. So um, again, as I mentioned, we take a look at the analysis in the plane of uh, missing mass squared versus momentum. 
So you have, um, you have these, um, these two signal boxes, which here are shown blinded, and you can see the estimate of the, of the estimates of the background and the number of reserve background counts, and that allows us to unblind the data, and we find 17 signal candidates in 2018 data plus three candidates from before, um, allowing us to come up with a measurement of the branching ratio um, with an uncertainty of about 40%, okay? So um, that's a 3.4 uh, sigma signal significance. It's the most precise measurement to date. Um, but ultimately, what our real goal would be would be to try to get in NA62, the measurement down to the 10% level. So we resumed data taking uh, in July of 2021. In fact, we will be starting again this year uh, on April 25th. Um, with uh, several key modifications to the experiment to reduce the background from um, upstream decays and, and, and interactions. We also now are running at a higher beam intensity. Uh, before we were limited at 70%, now we can go up to 100%. And um, if everything goes well, we would expect to be able to do this 10% measurement by long shutdown three, which is currently in 2025. Okay, so let's take a look at what the longer term uh, program might be at the SPS. So this is sort of the latest uh, March 2022 estimate of how running might look uh, at the, well, at the LHC really, because we're completely parasitic at the SPS with respect to LHC, but also at the SPS. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, um, long shutdown three starts at the end of, of 2025. So this is the run that we'll have right now. And then um, there'll be this long shutdown three, and we start at the SPS a little earlier than, than at LHC, so we would be starting in the beginning of 2028. And that gives us five years of data between 2028 and 2032, and another five-year window starting in 2034 to 2038. So I think there will, be, there will be physics at the SPS for as long as there's physics at the LHC, so this gives us an opportunity to have an integrated program to really pin down new physics and chaos decays, measuring all of the rare chaos decay modes, both charge and neutral, to try and give clear insight into this flavor structure of new physics. So what is needed in terms of protons? Uh, that's a very important question. Um, so some of the operational scenarios were, were studied um, a, in, in the context of doing a beam dump experiment at CERN as a part of physics beyond colliders. And, um, you know, our estimates are that in order to do a measurement of K plus to pi plus new nu bar at the 5% level, so with four times the statistics that we have right now, um, we would need a four time, four, four fold increase in the beam intensity. So, um, and to do a 20% measurement of K long to pi zero nu nu bar, uh, we would need roughly a six fold increase. Um, so this would take us right up to about uh, one times 10 to the 19 protons on target per year, um, which is, Okay, so in 2018, there were 1.2 uh, times 10 to the 19 protons on target per year, but maybe this number can be pushed up a, a little bit more, and that would leave the possibility for doing with the available protons a can experiment at uh, sixfold the present intensity and also have a diverse North Area program. So that should be possible. Um, a lot of work was done on studying what, you know, what would be needed, and I'm not going to go through this long list, but the point is, is that there are a lot of issues in order to get so many protons to the experiment, in particular involving radiation protection and other issues like that, that had to be studied. But the point is, the conclusions are written, and they look like things are fairly possible, like things can, can more or less be done with modest investments. Um, and so it should be possible, in fact, to do a, an experiment for K plus to pi plus nu bar um, at high statistics. Um, as I mentioned before, the decay of light technique is well established. We know that the experiment can work, okay? Uh, we know that we can get the protons. So a next step would be to try and get a measurement at the 5% level. Um, the main challenge is gonna be at the, with the detector trying to make everything run this fast. Because right now we have a lot of problems with um, event pile up and random veto, basically accidentals. Um, so the main issues are trying to make, it's gonna require a suite of new detectors which are gonna to have to run more quickly. Then the question is, is it also possible to do a K long to pi zero in a new bar experiment at the SPS? And this is uh, something that I'm, I've been working on in particular a lot. Um, it turns out that the SPS is well lended to a situation where you do a high energy experiment, which could be very complementary to KOTO. Koto. The systematics are different because if we had a beam, for example, with a mean momentum of 40 GeV, we would have the photons from the K long decays boosted forward 
Um, they fold up. Most of them are on the calorimeter. They can go into these, these, these photon vetoes. It makes the photon vetoing a lot easier if you're talking about vetoing a one GeV photon as opposed to a 10 MeV photon, for example. Okay, and so you would have roughly the same uh, vacuum tank layout and fuchsia volume as in NE62. And so this has been studied and it turns out that one could reasonably expect uh, an experiment to get 60 events of K log to pi zero nu bar with a signal to background ratio of one, which would translate into about a 20% measurement. Okay, so um, there's actually been some studies, for example, of what a neutral beam line would look like. Um, and in particular, the most important parameters, such as the production angle, the solid angle, uh, um, and the, the beam momentum um, have, been, have been decided. There would be four collimation stages here, as opposed to the two in Kodo. Um, there is one problem, however, and that is that when, and this was, uh, let's say, recognized from the beginning, but we had to take a step back and redo some calculations because it turns out, as I mentioned before, lambdas are produced order one with kaons and they're produced in a very forward direction. And some of these will have 400 GeV of momentum and will end up in the detector. And it's a very dangerous background, this lambda decaying to n pi zero. For that reason, it is likely that we would have to lengthen the beam line. And so there have been a variety of studies about different places where we could put the target upstream. So this is an example on the surface, and this is the layout of the, uh, of, 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 of the beam line. And this area here is where NA62 is now. Okay, so the current T10 target is where the yellow is, and we would try and move the target upstream or possibly extend the hull downstream. Um, so as some last words that I have uh, before concluding then would be about what about the possibility of studying other decays at a facility of this type? Um, for example, what about K long to mu pi zero lepton plus lepton minus? Well, you know, this is something that up to now has not been studied as much because it's difficult to do experimentally. Um, and the uncertainties are somewhat larger from the long distance experiment. There are various other components of long distance physics that you have to understand well um, in order to, uh, to, to get the new physics out of this. But um, between lattice and uh, experiments like LHCB, this is maybe something that can be tackled. Um, and so um, it would be very interesting because then you get this uh, nice information on the S to DL plus L minus uh, transition, you can explore helicity suppression in these uh, uh, flavor changing neutral current decays. I wanna push in just a plug for uh, LHCB and the role in LHCB in this regard. Um, LHCB actually is an excellent K-on experiment because they have 10 to the 13 K shorts per inverse femtobarn into their acceptance. So you actually have about one stage hadron per event. Um, they have such a high production rate that even in run two, for example, um, that compensated for their low trigger efficiency and, and relatively short um, uh, fiducial volume acceptance. And they had a, you know, a very, a, some success in studying, for example, K short to mu plus mu minus and good prospects for K short and pi zero uh, mu plus mu minus. They, they made a nice publication of uh, limit on the branch ratio for K short and, and, and mu plus uh, mu minus. So um, what this means is, is that, well, getting back to NA62, the, the idea could be that we have this integrated program where we start out with a K plus beam, try and do the 5% measurement um, of K plus to pi nu nu bar, um, then maybe switch to using, setting up the K long beam, using the charged particle final state detector, um, that would allow us to do K long to pi zero lepton plus lepton minus, and also, study the valuable systematics that would be needed in order to tackle K long to pi zero nu bar. And then finally in the end, move on to the uh, K long to pi zero nu bar stage. So as a summary then, um, the um, K to pi nu bar and other rare count decays are uniquely sensitive probes for new physics at high mass scales. So you have uh, Kodo, which is working on getting K long to pi zero nu bar at the level of the standard model sensitivity by 2025 and NE62, uh, which has a, an interesting uh, multi-generational program um, in, in store for trying to tackle all of these branching ratios bolstered by uh, some branching ratio measurements on some of these supporting channels from LHCB, for example, and, and K short uh, to mu, mu, uh, mu plus mu minus or K short to pi pi zero. Um, so I think that the point is, is that these next generation experiments uh, will provide a powerful tool for this search for physics beyond the standard model. And it is in fact, a multi-generational multi effort, which is in mid-course with plans ex 
extending possibly to 2040, which would be 35 years after more or less uh, Paolo and I had that discussion back in, in, in 2005. So yes, I think Paolo predictably is turning out to be correct uh, in, 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 in this statement right here, but we're learning very much and doing a lot of great physics along the way. Okay, thank you very much, Matthew. Are there questions for Matthew in the room? Yes. Thank for this uh, very nice overview. So how, how do you see this uh, discussion on the high intensity nuclear program at CERN evolving? So can we, can we imagine to have, I mean, an upgraded uh, NA62 uh, experiment uh, around four running on charged kern and then evolving the clever uh, right. so that, that... age and, 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 and another point. So the, the modification to the, to the detector uh, for, to run uh, at around four uh, uh, intensity for charged kern is a major modification or is uh, adiabatical? So it's not adiabatic, okay, in the sense that I think that the point is, is that um, uh, the, okay, so here's the point. I think it's adiabatic once we get the first step done, okay? So I think that going from NA62 in its current phase to NA62 times four is going to require a relatively complete rebuild of the detector, okay? So this would be something that would have to be done. Many parts of the detector would have to be rebuilt before 2028. Uh, in particular, the things that are most critical would be the giga tracker, which has to go at three gigahertz, okay, and without melting, okay. Uh, so the giga tracker, straws, uh, which also have to go at much higher rate. And probably the calorimeter, because the problem with the with the NA62 um, calorimeter is that um, you know it's um, it's got the appropriate uh, photon detection efficiency, okay? But um, its time resolution for 20 GeV pi zero is like 500 picoseconds. It's just not enough. We really need 100 picosecond time resolution in order to get a five sigma decay window, which is on the order of, you know, um, um, a couple of nanoseconds, okay? Um, so I think that this means that some of the key detector systems have to be really rebuilt. So I wanna get away from the idea of thinking that that's an adiabatic transition. At some point we have to say, no, we're gonna build a new calorimeter. We have some ideas, uh, for example, we've been looking at this uh, Shoshlik technology, maybe with a modified uh, scintillator uh, based on nanocomposites. We have ideas for the small angle veto. Um, there are, there are um, other ideas, for example, for uh, uh, a new giga tracker. So, I mean, there's a lot of, 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 of R&D that's gone on. So we kind of know what we have to do, but we need to do some real things. Now, the idea is that if we can do this, then the successive stages should be easier because the, uh, we can build a calorimeter which can easily do also K, zero, K, K long to do to pi zero in a new bar. So the idea would be design that from the outset. Also with the, with, you know, with the, with the large angle photon veto, veto is one of the biggest construction projects for Clever. We don't need all of them right away for uh, the K plus experiment, but we could design them in such a way that as they become available, we can use them in the K plus experiment to reuse them again, you know, for clever in the successive phases of the experiment. So in this integrated, so-called integrated program, this thing that, 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 that I always talk about, we, 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 we've always talked about, about um, designing the detector to be maximally reused. That wasn't done in NA62. NA62 was largely made from recycled equipment. Okay, and, uh, and, and, it was really just designed to get the 100 events of, of, of K plus to, to pi plus new new bar. And that was the end of the line, okay? Now we're not gonna do that anymore. The next, the next step would be to, to try and, and plan something with a reuse potential to do the whole program. Another last question for Matthew. So uh, you were speaking about the data acquisition and triggering, which is to my understanding, one of the major problems that 
uh, in, the, in the future. So what is, uh, do you think that the development that is are done in the LHC for the- Absolutely. Market? So how much is the, the cross uh, inter the interference between you and- the <laughs> Interference, constructive, hopefully. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So, I mean, we have a prototype, for example, on, on, on the level of, of data acquisition. So it, it's actually interesting in, in, in terms of data acquisition, the, the real issue is maybe, okay, not so much the event rate, okay? Although the event rates can be, can be quite high. But it's also the amount of data that the detector will produce because particularly for the uh, small angle and main calorimeter, okay, so we'd be looking at, you know, sort of on the order of 20,000 channels perhaps. Okay, those will be fully digitized, right? And that becomes very important for the high rate operation because you need to be able to do double pulse separation and find small photons that might be, you know, uh, maybe otherwise you would miss, right? You know, and things like that. So we really wanna have all of that information. So. Um, there's a lot of, of data rate issues. So we have people who um, um, are working on Atlas. We even have some ideas that are being implemented in some of the new detector upgrades that are being done for um, um, this, um, um, even right now in, 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 let's say, run three um, or run two with um, data being um, acquired uh, and, and, and pre-processed by these Felix boards, for example, on a new networking model, which was inherited from Atlas. So uh, yeah, I mean, so there is some, some, some communication that way. Now, the, you know, this is maybe something that really at the level of the acquisition architecture is maybe just sort of getting, I mean, not completely just getting started. We're trying ideas, we're trying to define the specifications and so forth. But there's absolutely, you know, uh, an overlap between those goals. Thank you very much, Matthew. I think that we have to move on to, to Simone. Up to now, we have talked talked about uh, flavor physics, which was uh, the realm or the kingdom of power. Now we move to hadronic physics that was more the interest of uh, Juliet. So please. Okay, it's a great honor for me to be here remembering Paul and Juliet and uh, discussing the Chloe legacy to Adron physics, which was mainly concentrated on the study of the properties of uh, light noises. This picture comes from the Daphne physics handbook. This is uh, uh, the period when I met uh, Paolo and Juliet at the beginning of the 90s. Uh, Daphne was uh, proposed by INFN a couple of uh, couple of years before, and uh, there were uh, there was a lot of excitement inside the lab, a lot of uh, people uh, involved in this uh, new endeavor from INFN and a lot of uh, theorists and uh, experimental people working. Um, and this, a lot of uh, young students uh, participating to the project. I arrived here as a, a student uh, and I was really hooked by all this atmosphere and decided to stay. As you can see from here, uh, Paul and Juliet uh, were participating in this Daphne study group that were, uh, was uh, studying the physics of uh, Daphne. And uh, in particular, uh, uh, Juliet was interested in the study of uh, hadron physics. Here you can see a contribution from the Daphne physics handbook from uh, her, who is a, a student from Stony Brook and uh, Paola Francini, which contributes from the theory, theoretical side. And they were coming from uh, cast experiment with, uh, with their knowledge on crystal calorimetry and study of the Lucian spectroscopy. So they contribute uh, to the calorimeter group uh, with the, the clustering uh, uh, algorithm, the first clustering algorithm and uh, kinematic space. And this is the first study really on uh, F0 and eta prime uh, pre present in this um, Daphne handbook. Uh, 
uh, Chloe was not primarily designed for Hadron physics, but it, it has a lot of uh, key ingredients to perform precision Hadron physics in any case. First of all, there is a lot of light uh, mesons. Uh, for example, uh, for each uh, inverse pent bar, there are four 10 to the 7 eta produced. Most of them are produced in a really clean environment. Uh, for instance, the eta prime are produced from fire radiative decay, so they are clearly tagged by their monochromatic decoy photon. Then the state of the art detector, of course, is another important key ingredient for all this. Large acceptance, high precision momentum tracking, excellent time calorimeter, uh, allows a kinematic fit uh, of the event, uh, improving the resolution, thus reconstructing with high precision all the uh, event. This is uh, how I started my interest in atom physics. Uh, um, Juliet proposed me in 98 to start working in this um, field uh, by studying the properties of the scalar mesons, F0 and A0. I accepted because they were interesting particles with some uh, unexpected behavior. So I started working with that. I remember the first meeting we had together where uh, always uh, Juliet was bringing her famous candies that were always present in all uh, Claw internal meetings. One year later, 14 of April 1999, Claude had, had his first collision. We have some period of engineering run. And we had the first continuum data taking 10 days at the beginning of August for the first beam uh, um, commissioning, a detector commissioning with physics data. We integrated 200 inverse nanomore. And after a couple of weeks, we were able to present some results coming from part of this data to in Beijing to a Hadron conference. It was really, uh, it was really possible in a few days to extract uh, some, uh, some um, first things on the uh, radiative high decays involving eta pi zero and epsilon. These are the one slide of that talk. Uh, the results on phi into eta gamma with gamma gamma phi state. And you can see here how it was uh, amazing the data Monte Carlo comparison at that time, really after a few weeks of data taking. Uh, we had a good agreement in all the kinematic variable and we have a number of uh, major events that was well within 10% with the, our expectations. Of course, this not uh, uh, came by chance. It was a hard teamwork, starting from, from the Daphne team, which provided uh, a good beam for, uh, to us and all the people involved in the design, uh, construction, and commission of the detector, the calorimeter and the brick chamber. Uh, Paul, of course, had a key role in all this. I remember him in all uh, meetings. Uh, discussing uh, small details uh, on all the aspects of the detector uh, construction and design construction and commissioning and but also having in mind the, the physics outcome of this. At the time, uh, despite the small statistics, we were already able to see some uh, zero candidates. Uh, we have a dozen of them. And here you can see one of them, five in the five photon final state, five uh, clean clusters inside the calorimeter with two couple of uh, pot, two pairs of photon coupled to pi zero with the proper invariant mass and uh, the mass of D zero of about in 1990 MU. The first uh, data taking of Chloe uh, was in 2000, uh, 16 in Berkeley Coburn. And from that, we published the first results on atom physics in 2002. These are the three papers published that year. Uh, two of them uh, were studying the properties of uh, scalar mesons, uh, A0 in the eta per zero gamma final state and F0 in per zero per zero gamma final state. And then we've also uh, measured 
radiative decay of pi into eta prime and eta, uh, measuring the ratio, the branching ratio, the pseudo scalar mixing angle, and putting a limit on the diurnal content of the eta prime that was 15% uh, in this article. This is the list of papers based on CoE data from that first uh, data taking of 2000, uh, year 2000. Uh, besides the three uh, papers I showed you before, there was uh, the study of the dynamics of eaten to three pions. Then we had another data taking in 2001-2002, corresponding to 450 inverse Hickelberg. And that we study in other other decays, uh, test of uh, fundamental symmetry, again, the studies of uh, property of scalar mesons, uh, measurement of the eta mass, uh, some more studies on the eta to prime mixing, and the um, Dalit's plot analysis of eta and tripines, both in the charge and neutral final state. The last uh, data taking was uh, during 2004-2005, uh, 1.7 inverse pentoban acquired, and there we can we started uh, studying uh, rare decays. We have uh, searched for the fine to the short pressure gamma decay in order to extract information again on scalar mesons for uh, charged uh, particles decays in prometa. Again, a decay dynamics of, of uh, eta decays. Uh, that's the case of the phi meson uh, to, to extract the trans transition from factor information and uh, another limit on the eta quadrat dynamics. Uh, during the cloid data taking, we also had some uh, energy scans uh, we, we running out of the phi, and from that, we uh, performed three papers, one of the Lepton universality, the cross section of this process, the plus and minus from eta by zero, and the first study of uh, gamma gamma physics uh, uh, measuring the eta weak in common. Uh, overall, there are 25 papers uh, produced in about 20 years where we deeply investigated the property of light scalar, pseudo scalar, and vector measures. Um, several of these measurements are still the best uh, on the market. I want to show a couple of uh, this analysis. This is a summary of the work done on scalar mesons at CLOE. Uh, we studied the property of scalar mesons in these three different channels, by zero, by zero gamma, by plus or minus gamma, and eta by zero gamma. The interest of this kind of decay, so production through uh, fire additive decays was in the fact that having an SS bar uh, as a starting point, uh, we can test the uh, K-on components in this kind of particles. So both the branching ratio and the mass spectra are sensitive to the scalar structure. So we measure, of course, both of these, uh, uh, the branching ratio and the Dallas distribution for this by zero by zero gamma final state and the uh, mass spectra for these other two channels. Uh, it was a big interaction uh, with the um, theories uh, to, to fit all of, all of these decays. Uh, also, Gino contributed to this uh, with the Rome group. I remember the meetings inside Mariani's office. And uh, we have fit the contribution of the scalar uh, together with the interference terms with the reducing of the ground. And in all of the cases, we have, we have found that the branch relation values and the coupling to chaos pointed for a quark, uh, for quark structure for this kind of mass. Uh, in order to show how we uh, understand these decays, uh, if we have uh, under control situation here, there are two, um, there is the forward backward asymmetry in the, the plasma mass channel obtaining from data Monte Carlo by including in the Monte Carlo uh, the simulation of the scalar and vector meson dominance coming from the neutral channel. We can clearly reproduce uh, the uh, presence of the scalar at the phi peak. This is the comparison out of the, the, of the phi peak where the scalar is not present. 
Another interesting measurement is the study of the eta papas famanus pinot. Uh, this is an interesting violet in decay, which is sensitive to the light work uh, mass difference. And uh, so a precision measurement of that, that explode density allows uh, the extraction on light work mass ratio. Uh, we have done uh, two measurements of this uh, in CROI with two different data sets. The last one is based on 4.7, 10 to the 6 uh, ETA events. This is the result, the unfolded CROI data that were used by several uh, um, theory groups uh, in order to extract uh, the work masses. So this is an example of this work by Colangelo, Lancio, Tiller, and Passemar. Fitting our data, this is the prediction of ETA to the not. This is not a fit, this is just a prediction overlaid in the data. And from this, they were able to extract this ratio with the narrow below 10%. In 2006, Chloe ended the data taking. These, those two features were taken just after the, the last Chloe shift. We took this picture in front of the detector with the Daphne crew to see the and Palo were always present in this occasion. And then we, uh, the collaboration went on, on, the, on the detector and we took the, the, this other picture. And you can see here Paolo and Juliet on the top. After 2006, of course, we continued the analysis of core data and we uh, in the new, completed a new uh, sector, a new kind of uh, studies open up that was uh, connected with what we were doing on hadron physics. Uh, in fact, in 2009, it was proposed the existence of a hidden gauge uh, sector, which uh, was, is weakly coupled with the standard model through mix, mixing mechanics of this kind. Uh, the interest for us was the, uh, of, of course, this was uh, uh, proposed to explain some um, astrophysical observation. And uh, the range of the masses for this particle, for the mediator, this uh, immediate sector was between 1 MeV and 2 GB with a coupling constant uh, of the order of 10 to the minus 3 or below. And uh, it was uh, observable at low energy colliders like chlorine. So we started to work also on this. And the interest was also a possible, uh, this could be a possible source for the discrepancy on any. We started the search on this uh, specific channel, I became into ETA and this uh, dark photon with the dark photon decaying to plasma minus or visible decays. And this is our last publication. At that, in that period, in, the, in this energy range, essentially, we performed the measurement just after the, the two done by Apex and Mami at a fixed collider. You can see we were able to exclude a large part of the epsilon and mass plane and uh, part of where the, um, these two parameters should lay in order to uh, explain the MU discrepancy at that time. We continued on these kind of searches uh, or uh, using continuum events. And this was the situation uh, in 2018 when we published essentially the, our last uh, result, we performed the one um, in, in a, another measurement in low energy with the plasma minus gamma here that when then was um, covered by an F48 uh, measurement. And also measurement in the pi pi gamma, momu gamma here, and this is the, in black, you can see the combined part. This sector is uh, continuing, uh, is, uh, in, it's interesting. In fact, you can see here, uh, review from 2021, where also um, LHC and the bar experiment are scanning higher value for the masses. Despite Chloe concluded this data taking, uh, um, Chloe Pro 2 are still competitive uh, um, with other experiments uh, currently running. And um, 
there, there is some work going on uh, in all of these sectors. Croy uh, already, Croy and Croy too, uh, has the largest existing ITA metal sample, three tenths of the eight uh, ITA produced, uh, that can provide, uh, of course, uh, results. Uh, we are looking for new physics as, as the electrophobic dark force mediator or axon line particles. We have a large number of five produced events, two for that can be used to uh, extend the study on transition for factor from dice decay, and we also a good source of omega mass. And in Kretu, uh, we have also the target to perform gamma gamma physics. I want to show a couple of uh, measurements that are in progress at this moment. Uh, one is the eta to phi zero gamma gamma. It is a long standing debate. Uh, since the interesting of this debate is the fact that it is uh, uh, the term six uh, of chiral perturbation theory dominates. It is uh, not a simple measurement. In fact, the measurement of the Grinch ratio decreased by three order of magnitude, starting from the uh, first measurement uh, in the 60s, because there is a lot of background to be taken into account. In Croy, we performed a preliminary measure in 2006 with three sigma significance that you can see here, with a Grinch ratio that was uh, four sigma away from the measurement uh, at the time. Okay, that was lately confirmed by, the, by Crystal Blue. So, try uh, to collaboration is repeating the measurement. With the aim of measuring both the branch ratio and also study the invariant mass of the two photons produced together with the phase zero, which can give some hints on the theoretical interpretation. And I also, also want to mention that also on the theoretical side, there are some uh, difference in predictions uh, on this. This is the new analysis. This is done on 1.7 inverse tensorburn. This is the result of the invariant mass. Here you can see the data and uh, in red the sum of Monte Carlo, which is completely dominated on the, from the intent to the out the ground. Here there is the contribution from the signal that reproduced here. And uh, by normalizing uh, to the eta to final channel, we confirm our, our old measurement, uh, so a, a smaller branch ratio with respect to the crystal measure. Here you can see also the behavior as a function of the gamma gamma invariant mass. Uh, also here it is clearly seen that our data uh, are uh, below data from crystal and also measuring the branch ratio from this uh, particular uh, dividing slice, slice by slice, we confirm our measurement. So we hope to conclude and publish this work soon. Another uh, work which is in progress is the study of gamma gamma physics where hadrons are produced from gamma, gamma gamma interaction produced from the plasma anus um, scattering. With the measurement of the cross section, it is possible to extract the transition for factor, which is important for the uh, determination of the hadronic light by light contribution to the energy mass. There were already feasibility studies of this um, in the 90s in the DAF 96 handbook. Here, there is the layer, um, outline of the da first DAF 96 handbook and second DAF 96 handbook. And this is a sketch of uh, ca coming from this uh, contribution here, a sketch of, of the tiger. After 20 years, uh, this was. Um, the targets were included in the CLOE to upgrade. And these are the picture of, of, of the two detectors. Okay, uh, the moment CLOE2 is, is performing the measurement uh, of the gamma gamma to phi zero in order to extract the width, we use a single arm selection for one uh, tag, uh, tag in one of the two HT detector plus a toy coincidence. And this is the, um, 
the, the results uh, at the moment. The, the, there is a lot of accident uh, background coming from radioactive Baba events, but we can clearly see the signal, this is from the signal. Okay. Okay, I want to conclude this uh, excursus I've done on uh, Hadron uh, Physics uh, at Cloy by mentioning that light measures still offer a unique opportunity to uh, study in deep detail uh, all of this, so to test the chiral dynamics of low energy, to measure fundamental parameters of the standard model, like um, force masses, I already show. Investigate the clock particle, study of fundamental symmetry, and search for physics beyond the standard model. Croy has uh, provided, uh, and is still providing, a fundamental results on light measure properties, the key dynamics transition of factor, and also limit for new physics. Uh, the work on other PD investigation is continuing with the higher luminosity and higher energy experiments, such as the SPIB, LP1, UHCB, focused from for colliders and words and compass uh, speaking about the scattering experiment. And there are also other proposed uh, experiments at JLab and Fermilab that are planning to increase the current uh, statistics to perform different studies on this. And uh, I want to conclude uh, by um, mentioning the lessons uh, that we have learned from Paul and Juliet uh, from all this uh, work of this year, at least from my point of view. I think that the, the, the most important lesson is the deep interest and passion for physics and for all. Uh, in all the steps of the experiment, starting from the very beginning, technical aspects, right? going to the big picture of physics. In particular, Paolo, as was already pointed out by previous speaker, gave us a lot of lessons in detectors, electronic and electronic and statistics. Uh, the other important thing is that the the importance of having created a stimulating, exciting, and familiar working group that created really good synergy inside the collaboration and was uh, really important to, um, to work uh, inside the collaboration to provide the interesting results. Another important point is they really uh, pushed and gave responsibilities to young people that were able to uh, to take advantage of this. Uh, and uh, the last point is that they, they always bother us with uh, attention to English uh, in our uh, sp spoken and written English. And, uh, so I think it was really a privilege uh, for us and also for me to, to uh, take part on this uh, Chloe enterprise and adventure. And uh, I think that our scientific community at the lab as a whole really experienced a great period uh, with the help of Paul and Juliet. So I want to thank them with this beautiful picture coming from 2006 from Paolo retirement. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simona. Paola. I would like to have a, a more deep comment from you about this F0 thing as a possible multi quark state. Maybe when you published the paper, um, this was not yet consider a multi quark state, but nowadays having a yes. higher energy. Yes, the interest so in these, states. of course, with all these X, uh, Y, Z state is... Uh, so I um, think that nowadays we can conclude yeah. that even at the strange quark level, multi quark states, states are there, so there yeah. are no more doubts that... Yes, uh, but at that time it was the, the first thing, so it was not, it was not a definitive answer on this, no, of course. It's important yeah. to see mm -hmm. that Claw was really a, a precursor yeah. in this kind of, of studies. And, and uh, looking back uh, in perspective, 
probably the, the first multi quark states was observed by you by the Troy experiment. And only recently, having higher energy confirmation, we can say that this is uh, undoubtedly uh, a multi quark state. Probably what we still miss uh, is uh, a theory that predict at the right uh, masses yeah. all these states that the picture is not clear at the moment. There are a lot of debates on, on all these slim states uh, from different experiments. So there is still a lot of work to do on this. Okay, Simona, are there other questions to, or uh, observations or comments? If not, we move to the last uh, talk of the morning. Now we move from uh, results in physics and what uh, helps us uh, producing them, that is detectors, and uh, we move to Ludovico, from Chloe to, to others and to, to the other big experiments. Oh, okay, so uh, I will uh, speak more, as uh, Fabio said, about uh, the uh, <coughs> detectors that are enabling us uh, to do this uh, beautiful physics that has been uh, so nicely uh, described by the previous speakers. And uh, I will uh, go uh, on some personal recollection on uh, some drift chamber I've been work working on in the last period. So the first is, of course, the Chloe drift chamber. Then, uh, as you may know, I have moved uh, mostly to Atlas, uh, the MDT system. And then uh, uh, from the side, I would say, I also uh, worked uh, a bit with in the Micro Mega system for the new small wheel in Atlas. Of course, uh, to do this, I will try to emphasize how the physics objective of uh, uh, the experiment will drive the design of a, of a certain detector very briefly because I don't have time uh, and, uh, and it's uh, everyone knows, uh, so it's just a repetition. And I will also try to uh, remember Paul and Juliet uh, and uh, many friends uh, that now I come back to see again uh, after a long time and people that I've been working with in these many years. So, okay. So coming to the Chloe uh, drift chamber, uh, this has to ensure an efficient and precise reconstruction of decay short and long decays after uh, a, a high decay in Daphne. So the uh, requirement is a uniform and high efficiency in the position resolution and the reconstruction of decay long decays over a, lo a large decay volume, because the decay long has a long, a very long <coughs> decay length of about three meters in Chloe. Uh, and uh, uh, it has to minimize the decay long re regeneration. So the, 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 ma the mass of uh, the chamber and also of the gas of the chamber has to be uh, very, very small to uh, avoid the regeneration, photon absorption, and also the multiple scattering in the volume. And also it has to reconstruct very low momentum muons, uh, sorry, very low momentum particles uh, from let's say in, in the range of 100 MeV. Uh, now uh, I am used to work with the multi, G, multi tens of GV or 100 of GV muons. And these are uh, very low momentum particles, at least also, also at the time, this was uh, very, very low. So also the, uh, the choice of the magnetic field has to be optimized. So the drift chambers uh, is a cylindrical uh, monovolume drift uh, chamber, four meter diameter and 3.3 meter length. And if I remember correctly, this was uh, the largest chamber, a monovolume uh, chamber in the world. And I believe that is still uh, uh, the, the largest. I, I don't know, but I think that, or at least it's within the largest in the world. There were 12,000 drift, drift, uh, drift shells with aluminum uh, field wires and tungsten uh, wires. 
in the ratio three to one. And I will uh, make some comments about this uh, ratio in the next slide. Uh, this was uh, in a very strange geometry for a, for a this chamber. It was a full stereo geometry. This was uh, due to the maximizing the filling factor. And this you can see in this beautiful picture that uh, is uh, really distinctive of the, of the cloid-rich chambers with this uh, kind of ellipse uh, of wires uh, illuminated by some sorts that were always there in the, in the cloid uh, uh, clean room. There were 12 layers of small, chamber, uh, small cells of 2.2 centimeters and 46 of 3.3 centimeters. And another important point was the, uh, the plates uh, the, and the external, uh, the external um, all the external structure. This was all in carbon fiber to minimize the, the, the material. Uh, the plates were really big uh, spherical plates of 10, 10 meters curvature with nine millimeters uh, of thickness, uh, which uh, were translating in 0.1 x zero, which is uh, what, uh, what is, was uh, needed to minimize uh, what I was saying before, multiple scattering, regeneration, and so on and so forth. And also the gas mixture was based on helium to minimize the mass in the tracking volume. And it was 90% uh, uh, helium, 10% isobutane. And taking into account the wires, uh, the, the uh, the, um, there was 900 uh, uh, meters uh, uh, of uh, X0, sorry, uh, one over 900 meters of X0 for, for this, uh, uh, this, uh, this volume. So uh, going to the drift cell, I want to discuss a bit this because it, there was a, a nice, uh, nice between quotes, <laughs> uh, uh, nice things that uh, was coming from Paolo. So the, there was a, uh, this uh, full stereo geometry, but it was not yet uh, clear whether it was uh, good enough to have an open cell. So without the uh, wires on the same line of the, of the tungsten wire, or it was better to put these uh, two wires to close the cell. So uh, to keep the response as, as uniform as possible, uh, the, the, uh, the, there was a decision after some studies to make a closed cell with these uh, two additional wires. And why I say this here is because Paolo was pushing a lot uh, to have a Garfield studies uh, to uh, define finally this uh, configuration uh, on uh, open and closed cell. And there was uh, uh, Clizia that was a, a student uh, at the time and Franco Lacava that were doing these studies at the time. On the other hand, uh, for some reasons, uh, uh, the, the study was presented by me here at CERN and uh, Franco was really upset and uh, it costed almost my friendship, friendship with him because I was uh, presenting the, 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 end, the end of the studies that was made by them. So, and, uh, and Paolo really was, uh, in that moment was really pushing to, and probably for this reason, I decided to, to make this uh, presentation without uh, waiting for, for Franco that that day was not uh, uh, available. Uh, so he couldn't do that, that thing. And, and there was no Zoom at the time. So you had to go there to, to, to give this the presentation. Another important point of the uh, a strange thing of this uh, this uh, big this drift chamber is the fact that uh, the geomet the full stereo geometry entails the fact that uh, uh, along the wire the, the shape the geometry of the of the of the cell changes and this means uh, that uh, there is also a change of the RT relation. Uh, as a function of the angle in which the track, with which the track uh, arrives inside the, the, the cell, and also of the, the geometry of the cell itself, this beta, beta angle here, and this phi, phi angle that is the, uh, the angle the, with which the track impinges in, this, in the cell. So as you can see here, the, uh, the drift, uh, uh, the RT relation for, long, for large and small cell at, in particular at the edge at the edge of the cell are very different and you need to, to have a good resolution uh, special, um, measure, measurement resolution you need to know very well these all these different these branches of the 
of the of the RT relation. And this was done with a very complex calibration problem uh, program that was uh, developed by Patrizia De Simone and Anna Ferrari, and uh, also some others has, uh, has um, made some uh, <coughs> some uh, um, contribution to this. And with these really complex things in which took, took into account all these uh, 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 geometry constraints, you could uh, arrive to this very nice uh, uh, position resolution for all the, cell, all the cells in, in the drift chamber. Going to the wiring, this also was uh, a real enterprise and uh, several, the, I just put some here, several innovative te techniques has been uh, included uh, and developed in the, uh, in, the, in the construction. First of all, I, I think that the automatic stringing using a sophisticated uh, robot moving on several axes was one real, uh, real achievement. And uh, this one, if I remember correctly, it was called the Merolone. Someone can uh, re remember this? Yes, it was the Merolone, right? <laughs> and uh, I don't want to explain why. <laughs> so um, then there was uh, another important point was the precise positioning of the plates, because these plates has all this, the also for the fit throughs and to, to allow a precise uh, movement, a precise stringing between uh, the two plates of this robot, the positioning of the fit throughs uh, uh, had to be extremely well known. So this was a real, uh, another real challenge. Then uh, there was an electrostatic meter to measure the white tension that was innovative in the sense that before it was used all uh, the, the standard method with the, with the uh, with the magnets, and instead this was uh, allowing us uh, to measure uh, the, 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 the wires without using the, 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 the magnet that had to protrude inside the, the chamber, and also to, to measure again different layers, layers that, that were already, already being uh, strung, uh, and to, to understand if there was uh, creeping or, or, or other effects uh, uh, due to uh, the fact that, for example, the geometry of the plates would have uh, changed the, due to the, to the load and so on. And then also uh, there was a sophisticated calculation in terms of mechanics uh, to predict the geometry change due to the load of, this, of the wires. That, and uh, it was, uh, that was quite, quite, uh, quite a lot, several tons. So, this, uh, uh, this geometry change was uh, uh, compensated by a tensioning ring that was used to uh, stiffen the, 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 the plate. So th this was uh, several interesting things that were developed uh, for these uh, chambers. And here are some people that has been uh, really key in the, in the construction. Here is Stefano and Gianni. Uh, Giulietto with the electronics, uh, Paolo the fifth, uh, sorry, Paolo Valente. <laughs> and uh, here is the QAQC uh, uh, the, uh, period uh, um, part in which uh, uh, many of the people from, in particular from Rome, but also some others uh, from, from Frascati. Uh, so Erika, Barbara, Clizia, Alessandro, um, <coughs> Franco, Vincenzo, and Dante were doing a great job here. And this, uh, if you remember, is the measurement of the tension of a wire with this uh, electrostatic method that was very, very interesting. So <laughs> then uh, here, as you can see, at the end of the wiring, the, the field wires uh, and uh, the, uh, the signal wires uh, in this plot here, you can see that they have uh, the same uh, the same sagitta, so the same tension. Th that was uh, uh, also another important point because the creeping of the aluminum wires that was there for obvious reason was correctly taken into account, and then everything was uh, well well compensated. Here is the last uh, wires, uh, the, the 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 last wire that has been strung uh, on the, uh, in ninety seven. And here, most of the people that has, pre that has done the wiring of the, of the chamber, including Giuseppe, Riccardo, Luca Passalacqua. And they are, I, I point out them because I have not uh, uh, said anything before about, uh, about them. And of course, here is Paolo and uh, other people. So here is the completed chambers uh, with uh, Juliet 
uh, posing in front of it and uh, uh, Paolo and uh, Sergio. And another nice picture of the chamber with some of the uh, pipes uh, for, uh, for the gas and so on. So some personal recollection of the work in, uh, in Chloe. I want to start with the prototype construction lecture. This was my first uh, big involvement. And uh, I remember that uh, it was very nice. First of all, I, I didn't want to go to Lecce. I was thinking it was a, I didn't like the idea to go to Lecce. My mother said, it's a beautiful city. And in fact, it's really a beautiful city. I really was impressed. But apart from this, uh, it was also important, apart from the fact that uh, the, the, the prototype was important for other reasons. But during the, this work, we have uh, noted that the uh, wire was modulated, the wire tension was modulated in time. And then we have tracked down this through the thermal cycles of the, of the clean room. And this was also an important input for the, uh, for the big clean room that was, uh, in, was um, constructed here uh, in Frascati for the construction of the cloud chamber. Another interesting thing was the, uh, the construction of the cosmic ray trigger that we used for the, for the testing of the, of the prototype with Enrico Pasqualucci. Uh, we went there and we had a back station plus other equipment and we were uh, stopped by the police. And very likely Enrico, that is very precise, uh, I would have never done it, but uh, had the, the uh, Fattura Proforma. Otherwise, I would be with Enrico still in jail, uh, close to close to Lecce. Then, uh, finally, uh, I remember very well the, the third test beam of the prototype, in which the, our colleagues of uh, of Lecce has made a real a real masterpiece. Everything was precise. Everything was uh, uh, with with uh, with uh, with a full uh, program of measurement. They they made. Uh, all the tooling to move the chamber in the different angles and so on. It was really a pleasure. Uh, then another personal recollection that involves uh, Juliet that is very interesting because I was waiting to uh, the infirmary in LNF uh, together with Juliet to have a blood test, the annual blood test. And uh, she just asked me there, by just because we, we met there, if I was uh, interested in reporting on the Chloe Chamber on, on the uh, 96 uh, ICEP in Warsaw. And of course I was very surprised because I was considering myself not really one of the main people in Atlas, sorry, in Chloe. So I was thinking, okay, this is very strange. I'm just, almost just arrived and I was asked for, to do that. So, so I was, uh, of course I uh, accepted. And uh, the, the talk on the calorimeter was given by Stefano, Stefano Mischetti. And then I remember very clearly that the comments of Paolo and Juliet after the talk, in which, uh, of course, uh, he was, uh, he was uh, they, they were very much in favor of the, talk, uh, of, the, of the talk of Stefano, and they were completely right. I, I gave a very lousy talk. Okay, some nice picture here with the... Uh, uh, with the, with the magnet, uh, here is uh, with, uh, with Sergio. And here I want to put this one also for, to remember for Paolo, Paolo Laurelli, that has left us a few days ago. But the, the, this, this I think is the visit of Roberti. Okay, then uh, one la about Chloe, one last word on safety. <laughs> so I have seen, I have found these two pictures that uh, if I would allow something like this uh, now at CERN, I would be put in jail. And uh, I think that Sergio, that was my direct supervisor when I started to do the technical coordination, would agree with this, right? But I believe that you were the technical coordinator when these things were done. <laughs> huh? Nobody's perfect. <laughs> Okay. So I fully agree, but this is uh, okay. Uh, when I when I show this this picture to 
my legs glimos, I, uh, <laughs> she was with <laughs> like this. In any case, it, it, it's, it's, it's a nicer recollection because people were working like this. It, it's dangerous, but were very professional. They, the people knew what they were doing. And I think that this is the, the lesson, I think. Okay, now move to, to the uh, Atlas Mean Spectrometer. Uh, this has been uh, <laughs> designed uh, as a standalone uh, object uh, uh, to measure the momentum with high precision, uh, the momentum of uh, very high uh, momentum muons. And why standalone? Uh, because in the early 90s, when uh, we started to work on, uh, on, on this design, it was not evident at all that the silicon tracker would have uh, been uh, capable of working uh, in uh, the background radiation condition that were foreseen uh, for, for, L, for, uh, for uh, uh, LHC. So the idea is that a standalone muon uh, measurement would have safeguarded the possibility of doing discoveries in physics, even if the inner tracker would have not worked. So this is the main idea behind, behind this, uh, this detector. So the, uh, the requirements is uh, high efficiency uh, on, for triggering on muons uh, with PT greater than 4 GV, uh, the high ac acceptance, and then an excellent standalone momentum resolution at high momentum. For example, at one TV, it was between one and 5%, sorry, uh, less than 15%, and also at lower momentum in conjunction with the inner detector between one and 5%, up to 200 GV. These are the contribution for the uh, for the in for the um, barrel part, and this is uh, the end cap part. The different contribution: the inner detector uh, and the muon spectrometer. And that's a, as you can see, the inner detector drives the measurement up to 100 GV or so, while the muon spectrometer drives the, me the, the measurement at high momenta. Uh, these requirements are then translated in a design with an air corticoid uh, that re reduces the multiple scattering, dominating at low momenta with very high accuracy in the sense wire positioning and the mechanical construction of the chambers. Uh, the precision monitoring of the mechanical deformation of the chambers are, is also very important uh, because this uh, uh, at high moment uh, is, a, is a one of the driving factor. And also the knowledge, the very precise knowledge of the RT relations so the, uh, of, of the, the calibration of the, of the, of the tubes and also the relative alignment of the uh, different stations within the uh, neon spectrometer. So we have adopted uh, what is called uh, the monitor of these tubes, which are uh, the chambers that are, that are uh, made of tubes, uh, either three uh, or four layers, uh, and this is arranged in, in two multi-layers of three or four la uh, layers of tubes. Uh, and they work uh, at a three uh, bar absolute pressure. Then uh, the wire positioning is one of the most uh, important thing and it's uh, achieved by, the, uh, by using a precision, high preci uh, precision pl plug, uh, this one. And there were many wars really between the different uh, um, uh, institutes uh, on, the de on the design of this plug. Uh, this was uh, really something <laughs> cruent. <laughs> Uh, and also the tubes were positioned with high precision using some combs that were uh, fabricated in the uh, different labs, and including uh, Frascati, Rome, and so on. The chamber uh, uh, were, um, had to be monitored in terms also of uh, uh, the deformations due to uh, the fact that uh, the, the temperature may vary during the day or night, and even if the, the cavern is rather stable, but there are differences in temperature. Uh, the, 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 there may be um, vibrations and so on. And this has been uh, tackled by, in, uh, by embedding the chambers with uh, a, an alignment system that tracks uh, the deformation of the chambers, temperature re readings uh, with a DCS box, uh, and also uh, uh, about 1800 points uh, to, measure, to measure directly in local, the uh, magnetic field uh, um, because it's needed to, to, to do the proper track reconstruction. Track reconstruction. For the RT relation, uh, a, a rather 
a precise method to uh, measure the uh, articulation with an accuracy of less than 20 micron all along the, the, drift, uh, the drift region has been uh, deployed and it's, it was called the auto, auto calibration. I don't go through the details, but this was really, again, a, a needed ingredient to, uh, to exploit the possibility of this uh, device. Uh, then again, on the alignment, uh, this is a very important and uh, complicated system to uh, be sure that the, the, the chambers are in the proper position. There are projective lines uh, that emulate the straight tracks uh, to uh, locate the different uh, stations, uh, one, uh, one uh, with respect to the other. Then there are axial lines that locate the different station within a sector. And then there are, there are optical alignment within chambers to measure the distortion, as I was saying before. All this has been tested in a, in a, in a um, system test in the H8 line um, at the beginning of the year 2000. And uh, uh, this system test was measuring both the, pro, the, the chamber um, uh, parameters and also the alignment system. Here you have uh, some, uh, uh, some of the performance that has been measured uh, the, uh, in, in this test. Uh, for example, the resolution that is uh, uh, very well measured and also very well um, um, calculated by, with, with Garfield, as you can see here. Uh, this is the, the um, uh, auto calibration procedure, uh, the demonstration of the auto calibration procedure. This is deficiency. And here I want to, to, to say that uh, many of the people that were working in CLOE, in particular uh, the group of the calorimeter, so Cesare Bini, Paolo, Gauzzi, Antonio, Di Domenico, Alessandro Cardini, Cardini, Enrico Pasqualucci were also part of this, uh, this part of this uh, test beam and these things. I also want to, to uh, say goodbye also to Stefano that has been uh, one of the key people in producing this, these chambers in, in Frascati. Uh, a few photos of uh, the construction. These are to me very nice photos of, the, of this uh, detector that is quite impressive, I would say. And uh, this is uh, one of the most, uh, for me, uh, touchy, uh, touching uh, uh, plot that I, in my life. So this was uh, on the 18th of June, 2012. Uh, the, we were a group of uh, Italians that were looking at the data from, um, uh, let's say, Higgs in four, four muons in particular. And this was uh, Antonio, Fabio, uh, Cerutti, myself, Mario, uh, uh, Roberto and Stefano Rosati. And uh, in one single run, there were two more, two candidates that were added. So the day, the night before, this plot had this, this peak here, here, and there was no signal. The, 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 the morning after we had this, this signal. And this is for me the first time I saw the X. This was uh, really, really interesting. So moving to, uh, to another detector that we have uh, just now finished uh, the construction, not the commission uh, for the phase one and phase two upgrade of Atlas. Uh, this is the new small wheel, and in particular, I want to discuss about the micro megas that has been uh, constructed also in Frascati. So here, uh, the need of an upgrade is due to, to the fact that with the higher uh, <coughs> luminosity, uh, we, we need uh, to keep the high precision and efficient tracking in presence of a much higher uh, photon and neutrons background. Here you can see how the uh, efficiency drops in term, uh, if uh, you uh, add the background using the previous uh, uh, type of detector. So the MDT with the large tubes of three centimeter diameters. And this is how the, the resolution degrades as a function of the, uh, the, as a function of the impact radius, but also of the, um, the neutron and photon background. So this is one of the reasons. The other one is to have a trigger that is much more um, selective in terms of uh, 
um, noise reduction or background reduction. This, uh, uh, these two white things are, is the trigger that uh, it has been used up to now, while uh, uh, the blue, uh, the blue uh, is with the, with the um, online, uh, online offline nuance, which is what we want to, get, to achieve with the new small wheel. And then this is the offline with PT, uh, greater than 10 GV, which also can be achieved, but in phase two. So uh, this, uh, uh, and, and the idea is here to have a, a, a track before the, the, the magnet, before the end cap calorie, the end cap toroid, to measure the, the angle of the track and then to reject this, these events that are not, that are producing this background here. So uh, the new small wheel is, uh, uh, is it's called small, but it's not that small. I mean, it's uh, almost uh, seven meter diameter or so. Uh, there are uh, two technologies uh, for tracking and for triggering. These are the Micromegas and the STGC. There are 16 sector per wheel. These are the, you can see mostly only the large sector, but behind there are also the, the small sectors. And then there are, um, for each sector, two STGC wedges and, and one Micromegas double wedge. So here is the, the stratigraphy of the, of the wedge. And in total, we have 16 measuring points per track, which is, uh, I think, even too much, I would say. And also 2 million channels only for the Micromegas. Again, here, I would not say that this is a very clever way of doing, <laughs> of doing a detector. Maybe it would have been better to have less channels and, uh, and uh, less uh, problems in, in, the, in the detector construction. On the other end, at the end, we made, we made it, and we, I think that we will exploit it for the next 30 years. So how the, the working principle is that there is a, a region in which you have the ionization, the ionization then drift towards a, a, a mesh, and then you have 128 microns in which there is the uh, amplification of the signal uh, by a field of about 40 kilovolt per, cent, uh, per centimeter. Uh, the signal is induced on some uh, uh, resistive strips, uh, and the fact that uh, we use the resistive strips was the breakthrough to, okay, yes. Uh, the breakthrough to, to make this uh, detector working because before there was no resistive strip and the, the sparks were too much. Uh, and just last point, for inclined tracks, it is possible, even if it's very difficult, to use what is called micro TPC. So you measure the time of arrival of the different clusters and then you measure the angles by this factor. It's very, it should be very interesting. So uh, the, the, uh, each module of Micromegas is done uh, um, by four active gaps. Uh, there are five panels for uh, uh, two readout panels, uh, one ETA and one stereo, and a central drift panel plus two external drift panels. Uh, here you see some phase of the construction. The, uh, and here again, uh, some other uh, photos of the drift panels, the tensioning mesh, uh, the the um, readout panel that has been done in Pavia, this has been done uh, in, uh, in Rome 3, and the assembly that has been done in, in uh, Frascati. This is for the uh, one type of the four uh, types of chambers that we have built for the new small wheel. So uh, several issues, oh, sorry, oh, okay. Several issues were discovered so, uh, and solved during the construction. One of the most uh, uh, important was the fact that uh, to do these chambers, the cleaning, cleanliness is extremely important. So uh, we had to develop a, a, a technique to do a micro polishing of the, of the surfaces. And uh, here you see the, the car share, uh, the cleaning with the car share, which is quite, I would never, there to do this to a, to a detector, but otherwise it doesn't work. And then also the dry cleaning and the, the immediate high voltage test uh, to, uh, to be sure that there are no uh, dust, uh, no, no, no remaining uh, uh, 
dust inside the, the, the detector after, before closing it. And another important thing that has been discovered here in Frascati by Mario and, and, team, and, and the team uh, was uh, that uh, there are lower resistivity region in which uh, there are the, the sparks start to, to, to develop. And this is due to the, uh, to the design, really, to the design of uh, the, the strips. The strips have this interconnect to, to uh, allow a complete uh, uh, uniformity of the, of the resistivity. But when, uh, when you are close to the edge, this uh, entails the uh, fact that some region has lower resistivity where you have uh, this, uh, this formation of sparks. So Mario has discovered this, Mario and the team discovers and produced a patch. It's not really, <laughs> but it's something that makes us work. Huh? And uh, here are some photos. This is Carl Jacob uh, during a, a visit uh, here. And this is the assembly of one uh, of one uh, multi quadruplet uh, during this this visit. So the news link, uh, the news machine has been installed. This is the second one. No one was there was uh, putting even five five uh, francs on the fact that we could do it. Instead, we made it. This was really a great achievement uh, and. Uh, Again, the contribution of the Italian teams it was extremely important here. And this is when it was going down in the peak. And the first sign of life of the Nismo wheel during the pilot beam in October 21, there were the first signals seen by the DCS, not by the, the, the readout. The readout is still not yet in a, in a good condition. We hope to have it. But this is uh, the first uh, signs uh, during the splashes of the, of the LHC of the micromega seeing the beam uh, inside the, in, in Atlas. Coming to the conclusions, uh, all these detectors uh, has been constructed in the cloid drift chamber. This is uh, this, this, uh, in the cloid clean room. This was uh, for me an interesting way of uh, relating the, two, the, the, the three, the three um, uh, technologies. And the clean room had several lights has been adapted to, this, uh, to the different needs uh, in different times. Then there is also another thing that links all these uh, experiments, uh, in particular Atlas and LSCB, is that the people that have started the work in CLOE, uh, and in particular the young students uh, that at the time were working in CLOE, then started to uh, go also abroad in, in, at CERN and they are all very, very well uh, um, uh, recognized. And I believe that the fact that Paolo and uh, Juliet were here to teach us how to do physics, how to do the detectors, how to, do, how to ask ourselves questions. So this is the link between all the things. And so for this, I would like to thank a lot, Paul and Juliet. I think that we all agree on what uh, just said, uh, Rico just said. There are questions specifically for this uh, specific talk. I think everybody is hungry. Uh, <laughs> wants to go to, to lunch. So if not, we can close the session here. We reconvene here at 2.25. So, so five minutes uh, mm -hmm. before the start of the operation. Thank you very much, everybody.